Welcome to Epilogue Podcast, the show where we discuss some stuff that happened on a different show ages ago which nobody really cares about anymore. Hello, I'm Port Ponky. And I'm LeBlanc. Today, we're discussing Farscape, Season 1, Episode 20, The Hidden Memory. The crew of Moya spring Crichton from the Gamak base, whilst Moya gives birth to an unusual child. It's a boy! Uh, yes. Rigel's smug uh, response to that was <laughs> so in character. A male. Excellent. Yeah, uh, he's quite a awful person sometimes uh and there's a good example in this episode is of Rigel being awful yeah when he's uh it's implied that he's feeling up Chiana oh yeah how did you feel about that scene Rigel is an awful person that's how I felt <laughs> yeah but it's Played for laughs, but I find it very hard to laugh at sexual assault. Uh, was it played for laughs? I don't know. Rigel found it funny. I think it was just to make the scene uh, more tense. I did like the helium farts, though. Yes, they make a return? Not something I expected a callback to? Well, they, they're not just going to forget that. It's a biological function. You can't say someone farts helium and then never bring it up again. That would be funny in itself. Would that be that funny? For this show, I think it would be because they're good about paying attention to details. And <laughs> why would they just forget that? A different show, I would think, oh, they the writers screwed up. But if they did it here, I would give them credit and think it was intentional. They probably have forgotten stuff, though. They didn't forget about PK Tech Girl. Your prediction was correct? That was an easy one. Yeah. Although I predicted that, I still didn't see the moment coming. I thought, oh, she's going to save the day, and she'll end up on Moya. But then, no, she died right there. Uh, the well, pacing... two shot. The pacing for that stuff was really bad. Okay, so this episode had a lot going on, again. Um, they're cramming a lot into the last few episodes of the season, it seems. Uh, okay, Jillian had died right at the end, so uh, maybe we should go through it in order. Um, starting with the Gamic base rescue mission, I guess. Um... Last episode, I asked you your opinions on John's cellmate, and you didn't really have much to say because he hadn't really done anything. But now he has a name, Stark, and is kind of an interesting guy. What a reversal of character. Was it a reversal? Uh, well, for the viewer. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, how about this? It was a Stark change. Are we going to have to live with this pun? Yes. Assuming this guy sticks around, are we going to have to hear that everything was a stark something? From me, definitely. Okay, uh, well, I can deal with that. Okay, when he explains his shiny face, I kind of missed it, and uh, so I don't know what was happening there. Uh, He can... Hold back thoughts from the Aurora chair. How does that explain? I didn't, having didn't a... really explain it. Oh, okay. He just said a few things. I thought I missed it, and then I was totally ready to blame myself. Uh, well, you should be paying attention when you're watching the show, so I think you're you're already to blame. Yeah. If you weren't paying attention, what? Why are we podcasting this? <laughs> Distract you on your phone or something? 
No, I just had trouble hearing this one line that he said, and then I don't allow myself to rewind because if it were broadcasting live, I wouldn't. When this aired, they yeah. didn't have TiVo or anything, so that's just my experience with the episode. And then I'm recreating. Yeah, that, that's fine. That's fine. That makes sense. And he does sort of speak with a bit of a drawl to his voice. Yeah, I couldn't catch it all. He's a weird guy, anyway. Him and John seem to bond well. Yeah, he made him feel happy feelings. Happy times. And then they shot a bunch of guys. Yeah, with la cool laser traps. sounds. Oh, yeah, when they were running about with lasers, it was just uh, cool. Cool looking, cool sounding. More cool sounding than cool looking. Because the shootout, they were separated by five feet, it looked like. It was weird. <laughs> it should yeah. have been more spread out. This relates to what I was saying. The pacing on that's not very good. It's not clear what's going on. They're sort of shooting at each other. And then Scorpius appears out of nowhere, and that's frightening. And he gets John hostage. Oh no, scary. And then Jelena just appears out of nowhere? Yeah. She just spawns there. How did she get there? That makes no sense. She's only there for plot reasons. She's only there to get shot. Yeah, pretty much. How did she get to the surface faster than a bunch of commandos and get around a firefight to where they were? And she... also, also, she got a gun in the meantime as well. That part is more weird. Well, she knows the layout of the area really well. She knows some. Um hidden ducks to sneak through. I don't know. But she didn't have the tag for the command officer. Because they needed to get Crace's tag to get access up there. And then she gets up there without one? Secret hole. But then why didn't she just suggest that earlier? She forgot about it until <laughs> they left. That's the hidden memory. That's what the title is about. What is the title about? Because pretty much everyone has a hidden memory in this episode. John's hiding, I... Jelena Kreis is hiding his murder. Stark is hiding a memory that we don't know. The hidden memory plot falls apart for me with John. So he's keeping a memory from Scorpius. Scorpius thinks, oh, this is the wormhole information. And then. When he thinks he breaks through and discovers a new memory, it's something that incriminates Kreis. Why would John block that? Why would Scorpius um, accept that as the blocked memory? That doesn't make sense. He didn't accept it. He said, that, or he gave the strong impression that he believed it was false. But he was willing to give up on John and throw. Chris in there. He didn't give up on John. He for the, back in the cell. For the time being. Yeah, it's not in a rush. <laughs> His, uh... What it was, was he said, well, we could chuck Chris in the chair, because I love chucking people in the chair. Chris suddenly goes, oh, whoa, 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 hang on. And then Scorpius is interested. What's Chris hiding? Like, he didn't care at all that Chris murdered someone. Seemingly, he's yeah. just like, yeah, okay, whatever, I don't care about that. He was pretty indifferent. His lack of urgency is really scary. When that alarm goes off, uh, Scorpius says, yeah, this is Scorpius. He's so not troubled by it. Later he is, but when the initial alarm goes off, he's, he's more annoyed that he's being disturbed. The difference between him and Kreis is uh, quite gargantuan. Uh, insurmountable. Insurmountable. <laughs> oh, what's wrong with Kreis? He's not scary. Deep down, he's just a good guy that needs a hug. Yeah. Well, you think so? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Do you care? About Kreis? No. <laughs> when he was getting his 
brain scrambled, I thought, oh, good, we won't have to deal with him. Hush. Scorpius, on the other hand, I love his impatience with Grace. Grace was beating up the cellmate. Scorpius. He just hey, looks over and like, are you done? What are you doing, you amateur? <laughs> <laughs> like, he can't believe what Grace is doing. Like, when you see one of your friends do something that's monumentally stupid and you just stare agape at them, like, ah, why are my friends with you? <laughs> why? We must take John Crichton alive, so send in tons of commandos armed with tons of guns and get them to fire all over the place. Indiscriminately. <laughs> yes. Well, they didn't kill him. They didn't kill anyone. Oh, well, yeah. they killed Juliana. Actually, no, Scorp Scorpius killed Juliana. Yeah, that was his handiwork. So, what? The commandos were useless. They roughed up some walls. This is fairly typical, though, for um, unnamed security guys or, or commandos or whatever. Oh, I have another problem with this episode. Mm-hmm. So John is imprisoned with another guy, and they're literally there to have their mind read, have their memories ripped out of them. Yeah. And so he ends up telling Stark a secret that he doesn't want to be revealed. What does Why he would tell... you do that? Who? What does he tell Stark? Uh, that PK Tech Girl is helping him. Okay, yeah. Stark can block the chair, though. I don't know. Stark even says, oh no, now I've told you the chair will reveal it. So th this isn't really a problem, it's just more like characters sometimes don't make the best decisions. I guess John was of the mindset that he'd probably escape or die soon? Uh, yeah, one of those seemed likely. Plus Stark heard the voice he needed to say. <laughs> Pay no <laughs> attention to that voice, it's nothing, don't worry. Well, you can't, he, he could... Still, he still has a memory of that at that point, so he might as well spill that the details. Yeah, you're, it doesn't matter at that point. I think I almost like the memory uh, extraction sort of plotline more than the jailbreak stuff that it turned into. It's kind of interesting. You can create new memories, exchange information, and then certain people can block it. But someone's only freed from the responsibility once they are revealed to be blocking no nothing. You know, it's kind of a complex logic problem. But then they ended up shooting everyone, which is quite a good solution. Not as complex. Well, instead of solving the problem, it removes the problem. So the solution becomes simple. I really like that that false memory had a trigger. He had to think of something specific and then it activated it. Uh, yeah, and when the lady turned around, it was not Jelena. Very clever hacking. Apparently you can do that with an audio jack socket thing. <laughs> I don't know. I, I really hated that it was obviously an audio jack. Just make some weird alien hook. Yeah, but it needs to look like electronic stuff. Don't make it identifiably human electronic stuff. The tube was nice. Yes. It just had an audio socket on the end. <laughs> it seems that the peacekeepers do everything with audio cables, like old-time telephone exchanges. There's no displays or anything. No buttons. You just plug stuff in. It's ridiculous, although it's kind of nice aesthetically. I like looking at it. I I don't need people to like type at five hundred words per minute and see text pouring over a screen, and then them to look at the camera and say, "I'm hacking." <laughs> That's you know I can live without that. If they yeah she hacks the thing, she plugs A into B, and that's a hack, and that's fine. But she is played up as having extra knowledge in this sort of thing. 
and then it's just her switching out tubes. Well, she prepared the tube. Yeah, the tube preparation is the impressive it's part. Difficult, but yeah. For as smart as Jelena is, she couldn't uh, couldn't bring herself to just say, "Yeah, let's leave," because I'm probably going to get executed. I don't like how she wanted to die saving John. Well, she probably didn't want to die, but um, staying seems like I'm fairly certain that she would eventually be caught and probably executed in a terrible way for what she'd done. So the whole, oh, but do you, do you love me? <laughs> if you don't, uh, I'm just going to go kill myself. That's, I felt, I felt it was a bit weak in terms of characterization. Not it that, reduces her character. Not by much. stupid. Because she doesn't have that much character to start with, but it would have been nice if she had said, well, do you love me? And John was like, ah, it's complicated. And she's like, well, uh, uh, fine. I'm still going to leave, though, because I don't want to die. Right. And it's even more frustrating because they could have had her meet the same end, but still... Uh, if she went along with him, just go up on the roof, have Scorpius snatch John, and then she turns, hey, I'm going to shoot you. Oh, no, I'm dying. I think it frustrates me because as a female character, it's a bit cliche that they are emotional, driven by the heart, but she's really smart. She's as, as smart as John, who is like a very high-level engineer, scientist, on in Earth standards, which doesn't count for much out in uncharted territories, but Jelena seemed very, very intelligent. Until that. Until point. then. Yeah. And if she, if Jelena had been a male character, would that have happened? Nope. Plus, if she had gone with them, like she should have, you have the promise of awkward tension where, hey, do you love me? Well, I'm going to stick around. Is that good, though? That's just... I've seen enough love triangles in uh, television shows. Um, they're fine. I don't mind a romance. Oh, who's going to date who? Where are the bodily fluids going to go? Who knows? That's great, but they have spaceships and lasers. And the crazy bondage corpse trying to uh, steal John's brain. That's all much more exciting. That, and don't yeah. forget, there, this episode also had an explosion. It did, yes. Gianna so that... is an action hero. Oh, it had multiple explosions. I think uh, we've complained a bunch, but I will say I really enjoyed this episode. So did I. <laughs> it was amazing. Which is uh, weird, because we've been mostly complaining. There are bad things about it, but in terms of entertainment, I would rate this top-notch. I'm an easy sell if you have Scorpius being Scorpius, and Chiana as an action hero. It was a jailbreak as well, so that's up your alley. Oh, yeah. I keep forgetting that's up my alley, and then when things are up my alley... I'm still surprised, and then it's always plain and obvious to you. Let's stop talking about your alley. Let's talk about Chiana, Rigel, Pilot, Moya, and Kiddo. Moya Jr.? Big bouncing baby boy. Who's covered in guns? So, what's your thoughts on that? C uh, confusion? I would, I don't know where they're going with it. What is going to happen with the ship? Will they be able to direct it? Will they switch over? I have no idea what's happening, and I'm excited. That's a plot twist. That's definitely a plot twist. So, yeah. Moya's son has... And he didn't just say it has a gun or a weapon. He, I think Rigel specifically said it's covered in weapons. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think you're right. It's enough firepower to perform an episiotomy, at least. <laughs> well, the minimum I'm saying. 
I really like that baby Moya was going to shoot its way out. The, f the future will be an interesting one. I don't know. I don't know what to say because it's so out of the blue that, um, yeah, I'd rather just hear what you have to say about it. I'm mostly confused and excited. It's not something I saw coming, obviously. Why would I think the ship would be covered in guns? <laughs> Who would see that coming? It makes and sense, it... though. It makes sense, because Dargo did punch that thing, which had a bunch of Peacekeeper symbols. Oh, they they sold it. I'm. It didn't seem random. I just... I My mind didn't go there. Hey, I caught the obvious Titanic reference. I haven't seen Titanic, so I, I didn't. Oh, you have to have seen spoofs of that scene with the hand on the glass. That's all steamy. Oh, is that? Okay, I, I didn't know that was a Titanic reference. Except I, I did. I'm assuming it is. Because oh. I read it on the wiki, but... Oh, okay. I, I don't know what it's referencing. A sex scene, which makes its appearance in this episode funny. Because that is oh. not romantic when yeah. it happens here. That's uh, great. Mixed feelings about that. <laughs> There's one piece of proactive problem solving that I want to highlight. Something that annoys me about a lot of TV shows. Well, maybe not a lot, but some is when characters create plot constipation because they are stupid, or they make stupid choices, or they act in an emotionally stunted way for no apparent reason. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if he would just tell her that actually he works at a bakery or something, then the whole plot would disappear. But he yeah. didn't because he saw her eating a pastry from another bakery and couldn't, and, you know, that sort of stuff. It's deeply frustrating. So whenever I see a show where they don't beat around the bush and they solve problems, I like it. And in this episode, Jelena explains that they would need the ID tag of a senior, uh, a senior officer. John's immediate response was, all right, let's go bag a senior officer. <laughs> this, this is the solution. They need the tag. They need to go get one. There was no angst, there was no, maybe we can do this, do that, maybe. Jelena never said, oh, I can't tell them that, it'll hurt their feelings. No, this is the problem. John says the solution is we're going bag a senior officer. I don't know if that meant kill, at least capture, if not kill. Capture in a bag. And then tie off the bag so they suffocate and die. That's okay, unusually cruel, but... <laughs> that would work. Tie it with the string of the tag. Oh, yeah. So it's nice. slightly uh, ironic. So it's uh, poetic. Yeah, there you go. Of course, I was then annoyed because Erin somehow teleported down to the Aurora chair room. How she got there, I don't know. Oh, I didn't care about that because I liked that she got face to face time with Crace. And face to face time with Chris sounds like a TV show. <laughs> he interviews people, and he asks them how he could be a better villain. What could I do that would make you scared of me? He would ask it in a really passive aggressive way. So Scorpius, you think the face mask makes you look scary? <laughs> yeah, she got to shout at Chris and. Uh, bring up the whole irreversibly contaminated thing. A plot line that is apparently not... Like, they don't care that much about? Well, should they? I don't care much about it. Yeah, like, John brought Chiana onto the base in the previous episode. And they don't care. Scorpius is... Like, he doesn't look like the regular Sebastian, at least, let's say. He could be the dried, prune, pruny version of a Sebastian. He was out in the sun too long. Well, maybe he just has, like, I don't know, bad skin condition. 
<laughs> something but the impression is that he's not the same as the rest of them yet they don't care about it irreversibly contaminated is there I don't like the irre- irreversibly contaminated but when I was watching this I came up with a plausible explanation go on well remember the intelligent virus no that was jumping from host to host and infecting everyone yes okay so there definitely are life forms that are incredibly dangerous. I'm with you so far. So it would make sense if they did have a a, a rule, a health and safety thing. If you've met this life form, we'll have to kill you. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. So my headcanon is that Kreis pulled that out the bag in the at a point where it was really not appropriate, but technically usable. What, like some archaic rule that they don't actually follow anymore? I wouldn't say that, but more like a technicality. Oh, he's technically an unknown species, so it's within my rights to say you are irreversibly contaminated, despite the fact there's absolutely no evidence that he's any risk at all. And then (laughs) whenever they usually meet other species, they don't care that much. To me, that would fit with Crace's... Uh, sort of modus operandi of being a jerk. Do you have a quote you would like to share? If you can be an idiot, I can be an idiot. Who said that? Dargo to Aaron. Oh, yes. I really like that line because whenever a character on a show wants to do something outlandish they insist no one else follow them hey i'm doing this stupid thing let me go be crazy and then he says no i get to do that too you don't have a monopoly on being crazy it's good to hear characters acknowledge that what they're doing is probably stupid yeah that too because it sounds like a suicide mission. Um, not quite suicide. Almost, but not quite. <laughs> Moderately suicidal mission. When characters are doing a stupid plan, usually either they say, but it's super honorable, or, you know, it's it's crazy, but it might just work. Ah, that's the worst line. It's it, it, It's so crazy that it just might work. It's never just like, well, this isn't a very good plan. Uh, there's probably even a better plan, but we're, I don't know, let's just do this. This, this is the plan we have. Yeah. We're not perfect. It's not very good. Let's just see if we can make it work. It's a bit rubbish. That's nice. That's what people actually do. People make bad plans all the time. Yeah, and then execute them, knowing that it's probably not the best idea. (laughs) Lots of people injure themselves, and then when people say, well, why were you doing that? They sort of say, well, "Mm, yeah, I know, I probably shouldn't have been doing that. It's human nature, I think, to to sort of... um, (laughs) To make bad plans? No, it's sort of like a heuristic. If the plan is, uh, has at least enough merit that it's less sort of effort than thinking up a better plan. Like, the the average outcome is probably worth taking the risk on if the prize is good enough. Like, it, yeah, okay, you could push a ladder and get onto your roof to clean out your gutters, and that might not be very good, but you'd probably be okay, because usually you are. Or you could drive to the store and pay for, like, a ladder with proper safety stuff, and then you'd have less money and you'd be feeling miserable. You know, people will choose option A because, you know, it's good enough. Yeah, good enough is good enough. The, yeah, they're not trying to optimize for purely the best possible outcome. There's a lot of side effects that people just don't really care about. In this case, they don't care that much. <laughs> That they might die? Yeah, well, I don't think they want to die, but... I think if it came to them having to shoot a lot of people, they might be okay with that. That's not a big deal. Gutter cleaning has that high of stakes. Oh, people get killed all the time cleaning out gutters. 
I've never had to shoot someone while cleaning a gutter. It's because you only clean your gutters at night. How do you know? Because <laughs> during the day, you're watching the next episode. That is true. Well, let's go do that now. Good.